Okay, let's start. Uh, I have, there is a handout sheet that everybody should have. I, it's in the book that you own anyway, but I, I was afraid you might not bring that book to class since there are probably days in which you don't carry it around with you. Uh, and consequently, it just saves me a, a lot of writing on the blackboard. All right, well, our problem now is very simple. We don't have an awful lot of time left in the semester, and I have an awful lot of material I need to cover, so sometimes I'll just skip through things rather rapidly. I, I won't give you the complete account of metaphor because it's in the uh, book, but I want to at least situate our discussion within the larger context of current investigations into the philosophy of mind and linguistics. Uh, traditionally, uh, the way that the study of language is divided up is into syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. Uh, syntax, and I told you this on the first lecture, but I'll remind you again. Uh, syntax has to do with the forms in which linguistic expressions occur. So the syntax of John loves Mary is different from the syntax of Mary loves John, even though the same elements occur. Uh, and if this were uh, fancy, I would say the same morphemes occur. Uh, but they occur in a different syntactical order. So syntax consists of the elements of the sentence uh, together with uh, the order in which they occur. Uh, some languages mark uh, the uh, functional relations among the order by putting little uh, stickers on the end of the words called affixes. So in Latin, for example, the word order doesn't matter because you can tell what the subject is and what the verb, is, uh, what the object is by the things that are stuck on the end of the words. But basically, those are syntactical devices for communicating what? Communicating meaning. Meaning is semantics. So intuitively, uh, the idea of syntax is the idea of form, the formal elements in which uh, these uh, things occur. But the whole purpose of the formal er elements is to carry meaning. And what does meaning do? Well, meaning relates the syntax, relates the words and the sentences to reality. Uh, and so semantics is how you mediate the relationship between language and reality. Pragmatics is supposed to be what's left over. It has to do with the use of the words and the sentences, what you do with them. Uh, and the way that a lot of people think of this is to think of, well, syntax is form, semantics is meaning, and pragmatics is, roughly speaking, speech acts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, now, I'm very suspicious of this way of describing the situation. I don't think it's entirely false, but it's very misleading. It's mi misleading because it suggests that what people actually say is a matter of the semantics, and then what they imply or suggest or implicate, uh, that's a matter of the pragmatics. Uh, but I think you can't do it that way, that you can't really make sense of the semantics without bringing in a lot of considerations that are typically associated with pragmatics, and in particular what I call the background, or the, uh, the background and the network are essential uh, to understanding semantics, even though uh, on the traditional account they're not part of semantics. You know what is said if you know the meanings of the words and how they're organized in the sentence. But on the account that I've been presenting you, that's not enough to understand the sentence. You, only, you understand the sentence only against the background of presuppositions that are not part of the meaning of the sentence. And, as, uh, and within a network, of associated meanings as well as associated beliefs and other intentional states. Now the best way to illustrate that is with examples. Uh, and I've just come back from a conference on pragmatics in Madrid and I, I, I got a beautiful example that I want to uh, give you uh, that illustrates the point about the relation of, of semantics and background. Uh, incidentally, one of the nice things about the modern world is you can literally go anywhere and lecture in English. Uh, and we lucked out. I mean, uh, it isn't that I did anything, to, or that any of us in this room did anything to deserve this. It doesn't matter. If I'm in Beijing, Shanghai, Rio, Bangkok, or Vladivostok, 
I can lecture in loud American English and everybody will at least pretend to understand. Uh, so this is a benefit that we have achieved without actually having done anything to deserve it. The only thing we did to deserve it was win the Second World War and win the Cold War. Uh, without that, we'd all be speaking either German or Russian. And no doubt the time will come when we'll all be speaking Ch Chinese, but as they say, not during my lifetime. Uh, the Chinese have a real problem. I lectured on this in Beijing, and they wanted to know, well, when is Chinese going to become an international scholarly language? Uh, and the answer is, get an alphabet first. Uh, and that may yet happen, but they're uh, not anxious uh, to have it for various reasons. But no, uh, none of us are going to me memorize 4,000 Chinese characters. I mean, it's bad enough uh, learning French or German or Spanish, as the case might be. But in any case, it, uh, it's just a matter of luck that we're all speaking English. In terms of sheer numbers, more people speak Chinese or Spanish than speak English. But uh, for various historical reasons, we dominate the world the English speakers dominate the world uh, culturally and intellectually, a domination that won't last forever. But the analogy with Latin is pretty obvious. For centuries, Latin was the international scholar's language. Uh, and people could go anywhere in, well, travel wasn't so easy, uh, but they could go anywhere in Europe and lecture in Latin, and the writing in Latin could be read by educated people anywhere in European civilization. Uh, and indeed, one of the reasons that Descartes revolutionized philosophy was that he was willing to write in French. And that way people could really understand it instead of just pretending uh, to understand it uh, because the Latin by that time was uh, uh, pretty decadent. Anyway, it would be interesting to see how long English survives as the international scholar's language. But one of the amenities of the world is you can go anywhere, literally. The French resent it, but they will put up with it. Um, and occasionally, I lecture in French just to, you know, pour les emmerder un peu, just to, uh, to annoy people a little bit. Uh, but um, I, I got a beautiful example. And of course, I, it had to come from a, a native, this guy is a native Hungarian speaker. Uh, in a lecture he, he was giving in a Spanish university, and he gave the following, uh, the background. I, one guy says to another, uh, let's go to the bar and have a drink. And the other guy says, no, I can't. My doctor won't allow me. And the first guy then says, what's the matter with you? Uh, that's this. And now we have the same conversation, only this time. The first guy says, let's go to the bar and have a drink. The second guy says, no, I can't. My mother-in-law won't allow me to. And then the guy says, what's the matter with you? Now, the point is that the question, what's the matter with you, means something quite different in, in uh, the mother-in-law case than it does in the doctor case, just to spell it out boringly. In the mother-in-law, in the doctor case, it means what illness do you have that prompts the doctor uh, to forbid you from drinking? And in the mother-in-law case, it means something like, well, what sort of a jerk are you that you allow your mother-in-law to boss you around I, and even present you from having, prevent you from having a drink. Okay, now that's a typical, uh, 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 the, the, the example is unusual, but the phenomenon is typical. The phenomenon is typical is that in any sentence is interpreted only against the background of presuppositions, contextual features that are not part of the literal meaning of the sentence. And then the next step is to argue, well, in fact, they couldn't be part of the literal meaning of the sentence because if you tried to put in all of the contextual stuff, all the stuff about mother-in-laws and doctors and illnesses and domination and power relations within families and so on, if you try to write all that down, what you'd get is another bunch of sentences which themselves would only be interpretable uh, against a background of presuppositions and assumptions. Uh, anyway, I think that is, uh, the, uh, uh, what I just told you, I think is the correct view. Now, there's a huge literature about this, and most, I mean, uh, professional literature, and you can uh, 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 look it up. It, the, the problem with it is it's usually thought to be a question of context, and the idea is it's the context that determines uh, how you interpret the sentence. 
But that again is misleading because the context, the actual physical context, this actual historical situation in which you find yourself is only relevant insofar as there are features, uh, as the features of the context are somehow internalized in your mind or your brain. That is, the physical context only matters insofar as it is psychologically realized, insofar as it's psychologically real. Uh, so, for example, if there's a, a, a live uh, tiger inside this box, well, that would be an important fact about the context, but it doesn't have anything to do with the interpretation of utterances now because none of us thinks that. None of us knows or thinks or even considers the possibility that there might be a lot of dangerous animals running around. So if you're going to look this up, I haven't done it, look up contextualism. And it's sometimes called radical contextualism. And my view is said to be radical contextualism because I think that every, um, uh, every sentence is interpreted relative to a background. And it's misleading to call that a context. Let me give you a, a, another example to illustrate this. Uh, this is a standard example in the literature. You hear the sentence, Sally gave John the key, and he opened the door. Now, was it actually said or only implied uh, that first she gave him the key, and second he opened the door? Was it said or only implied that he opened the door with the key? Notice those sentences didn't occur. And then there's a big debate about how much of the meaning is encoded in the, uh, in the actual syntax and how much of it is carried by pragmatic considerations. And I want to say that, that, that uh, the question arises because it seems that the meaning of the sentence underdetermines the literal interpretation. But I want to say the sentence radically underdetermines the interpretation. When you hear Sally gave John the key and he opened the door, you think of some boring scene where they're standing outside her apartment or something like that. But just use your imagination. They're both floating in the middle of the Atlantic clinging to this bits of driftwood and Sally I, I coughs up a key that she has uh, digested and John puts it <laughs> inside the lock. Well, okay, you can then do it. Now, do you interpret it the same way? No, I don't. Then it has a completely different meaning. Or uh, it turns out John is kind of a big guy and he has swallowed door and door frame and Sally gives him the key and he swallows that too and then opens the door through the peristaltic contraction of his gut. That's a completely different interpretation. Or let have them both floating freely in outer space. I mean, the fact is you understand any sentence with, in terms of a very provincial and local set of presuppositions. All you have to do is use your imagination to see that you'll get a completely different interpretation. <laughs> so uh, my views, uh, there, there's an extreme view called radical contextualism that thinks all sentences are interpreted only relative to a context. And I'm a sort of radical, radical contextualist because I think uh, context isn't the right, even, even the right way to describe it. It's the, the rela relativism is to the background. <laughs> Uh, okay, now nowhere does this come out more strongly than in metaphor. And it's an interesting fact that some metaphors work in certain societies. And even though the societies have a lot in common, the same metaphor won't work in another society or won't work in a different language. Um, in English, if a horrible thing should happen that you don't come to class, that is known as cutting the class. And you say things like, Sally cut class last week. What a horrible thought. I'm sure you would never do such a thing. But in French, you don't say that. You don't say coupe. Uh, last time I spoke French, uh, my French student slang is out of date. But in those days, we said, um, elle a séché deux classes. She dried out two classes. Now, I can't think that way. I mean, how on earth do you cut a class by drying it out? Well, anyway, that's the way the French think. I can't do anything about it. I've been trying to correct them for decades, but they still persist. Uh, so why does a metaphor work in one language and not in another? I don't know. It has to do with background sensibility. But of course, that's not a solution to the problem. It's just a name of the problem. All right, now I want to turn to metaphor again and finish talking about metaphor. And then we've got to talk about the other subjects that we can 
um, I, I, that we have some hope of completing uh, during the course of the semester because there are a whole lot of other subjects on the syllabus and I don't see how I'm going to get through all of them. Uh, but now I'm going to turn to uh, some more comments about metaphor before we go to something else. Uh, okay, so questions about what I've said uh, so far. Uh, everybody's up. Yeah. No, it's not too late. Uh, I'm going to go through, the next step is to go through this chart and to show, show you that there are a series of ways in which semantics and pragmatics interact, and what I've done is give you a chart that describes those, but go ahead. So I was rereading your um, thing on Andrew's chart. Yeah. There's a part where you say that um, the sentence always retains the literal meaning. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then if we say that we're retaining the literal meaning, yeah. by adding the please, that's like saying, do you have the ability to pass the salt, please? And so then I'm saying please to your ability. Yeah. That no, that's a good question. Please is a modifier on the indirect speech act, not the no, direct speech act. No, but let's, but let's go through it. Why do you say please? Uh, well, it's more polite. It's short for if you please, uh, at least uh, etymologically it is. Uh, and it's an illocutionary force indicator there. It is an indicator. And what it indicates is this is a request. It means uh, it's a request as opposed to just a question, which is also another kind of request. But uh, more importantly, it means it's a request as opposed to an order. So. I, in the, on the highway sign, it doesn't say 65 miles per hour, please. Because if they put that, that would imply you have a choice. It's on the condition that you please to go 65 miles an hour, and we hope you will, then go 65. No, then it is, a, it is as they say, a law. A law, in this case, is a standing directive. But it's different from a request because a request always gives you the option of refusal. So that's why you have please there to indicate that it's not just a question. But all the same, the literal meaning is still present and still understood in a way that it's not understood in, uh, in the case of a metaphor. In the case of the literal meaning, can you pass the salt, uh, please, the uh, can you pass the salt can still be interpreted literally, and the proof is you can respond to the literal. You can say, uh, yes, I can, here it is, or no, I can't, I've broken my arm, or there isn't any salt on the table. So, and I don't think Grice understood this uh, fully. Grice is regarded as a sort of hero of indirect speech acts, and correctly so, because his uh, maxims are very useful. But I, I, I don't think he fully got that the literal meaning of the sentence is still... Uh, meant and still understood, unlike metaphor. In the case of metaphor, uh, the literal meaning, if you, if you interpret the sentence literally, you've misunderstood it. That is, if you respond to the literal uh, utterance, it's a joke. Uh, if you say, if I say, Sally's a block of ice, that damn Sally, and you say, well, that means she'll melt as soon as we get the room up to above 32 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, well, then you, that's either got to be a joke or you misunderstood the, uh, the sentence. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Well, yeah, sort of. I mean, but you don't, but you don't think that when you add the speed, that kind of negates the literal meaning? No, I do not think it negates the literal meaning. It makes clear that the full force of the utterance is that of a request. Right, okay. Yeah, so, and, and it's interesting, which of these, uh, uh, which of the indirect speech acts uh, uh, will, uh, uh, will normally take please and which won't? The interrogative very comfortably takes please. I, 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 can you, could you make a little le less noise, please, uh, is perfectly okay. But if you say things like, you are going to stop making that noise. And you add, please. Well, that sounds funny, and I can only interpret that, please, as it's a separate sentence. That is, you are going to stop making so damn much noise, please. Uh, meaning, I don't really intend it as a request, but as an order, and that's why you get this crazy intonation 
uh, to, to the utterance of please. Uh, English is wonderfully uh, subtle with all of these for reasons that I've, I've told you before, namely that in English it's a little bit rude to use the imperative mood unless you're obviously not intending the imperative mood unless it is an offer. Uh, so for example it's okay uh, to say uh, uh, sit down, make yourself at home and those are in the imperative mood but they're not really orders, they're offers. Uh, okay, other uh, questions about that? Well I want to go, yes? Well, is there still a background in a formalized language? Yes, I think so. Now, that's much harder to show, uh, but I did it with um, uh, arithmetic, uh, and we could probably do it uh, with, uh, I mean, I haven't thought it through in the case of, let's say, the predicate calculus, but you remember I gave you this example from Wittgenstein. Uh, we are trained that 3 plus 4 equals 7, uh, but it makes perfectly good sense to imagine a culture where they take the set theoretical aspect of arithmetic seriously. So they want to know, well, 3 what and 4 what? Well, if A equals 3 and B equals 4, then A plus B equals 7. But if you imagine it slightly differently, if you imagine it this way, Uh, I had it like this. Uh, how did it go? B was four, four. Yeah, okay. And A was three. Yeah. Uh, uh, then, um, so A equals three and B equals four, but A plus B equals five. And in that case, they say, well, it's obvious that A plus B equals five, and we don't do arithmetic take that way, except in some contexts. We do. If I say, how many people in the class can speak German, and three people raise their hand, and how many can speak French, and four people can raise their hand, it doesn't follow that seven people uh, can speak uh, French or German, because it may be the same people, and we don't count them twice in that context. Okay, so now the problem with the example you gave is that the formalized languages are typically not languages. Uh, they are forms of languages. So uh, uh, this is not a sentence. There is some x such that uh, fx is not a sentence unless you fill in uh, the value of the free variable there. And once you fill that in, then the background comes in. So if I say there is some x such that x uh, fx, that's not a sentence. It's got a free variable in it. But if I say there is some x such that x is a horse, then you've got uh, a, 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 an actual sentence, but it's got a content. But that's a context will that's a, a content will be understood relative to a background. Uh, okay, so I think that the thesis is perfectly general. The thesis that we understand uh, the uh, assumptions, uh, we understand the uh, sentences against the background of presuppositions, practices, ways of behaving, and assumptions. Now in the case of arithmetic, we won't allow you uh, to get out of the third grade unless you do arithmetic uh, the way the rest of us do it. But this exam the example from Wittgenstein is designed to suggest that that is itself relative to a set of practices, that the semantic content alone is insufficient uh, to fix uh, the understanding because the understanding that you have will always be relative uh, to a set of ways of under uh, a set of ways of doing things that you have been brought up on. Uh, okay, let me go through this uh, chart now, and uh, everybody's got a copy of this. Uh, uh, it's in the it's in your book. I mean, it's in the assigned reading, so it's not a mystery. I mean, it's not something new, but I want to go through it to contrast the case. In the case where the syntax and the pragmatics match each other, well, actually, I don't need to write it. It's here. In the, in the case of uh, uh, the first one, uh, where you have a perfect match, then the literal sentence meaning matches perfectly with the intended speaker meaning. Uh, my guess is that in normal conversation, that's probably fairly rare. Um, if anybody's short of one of these, they're available here. I, that in normal conversation, there's always more suggested or implied 
than is actually said. But we put that there just for the sake of completeness. Here you go. Uh, all right. Now, the interesting case, though, is where you get a separation. And the most famous cases are metaphors. Now, in the case of metaphor, I, there is just a huge literature on the subject, and I have not attempted to go through it. But just to cite some of the most famous mistakes, uh, the two standard theories of metaphor in the history of the subject have been the comparison theory that goes back to Aristotle that says every metaphor involves a comparison of two objects. Uh, so if I say Sally's a block of ice, I'm asking you to compare Sally with a block of ice. Uh, but that is opposed to uh, the interaction theory that says the metaphorical meaning is a product of the interaction of the two literal meanings. It's the interaction between your understanding of Sally as a, a human female and your understanding of a block of ice as a certain uh, type of physical structure. And the interaction of those uh, produces the metaphorical meaning. Uh, now, a third approach is to say there's really no such thing as metaphorical meaning. Rather, you need to distinguish between the literal sentence meaning and the intended speaker meaning. And the metaphorical meaning is just a special case of intended speaker meaning. That's my view, the view that says uh, there's some set of cognitive capacities by which the uh, hearer can understand the intended speaker meaning. And metaphor is just the name for a class of intended speaker meanings, whereby there's some systematic processes according to which you can get the intended speaker meaning by understanding the literal sentence meaning together with the background and the network. Now there's a fourth view that has recently become very influential, and that's Davidson's view that says there's no such thing as metaphorical meaning, period. There's just a literal sentence meaning. And when the a speaker produces the metaphorical utterance, uh, what we're being asked to do is to see the object of which the predicate uh, is predicated, to, to see that as, to see it as if it were uh, like the literal, the, the, the extension of the literal meaning. And the seeing as uh, locution here comes from uh, Wittgenstein, as you know, uh, the famous duck rabbit, uh, which can be seen either as a rabbit looking up that way or a duck looking that way. That is one of the lamest duck rabbits that I've ever drawn. But anyway, uh, you're still supposed to be able to see it as a duck, a duck looking that way, a rather less intelligent duck than I would normally draw, but it has a certain charm, so let's leave him as he is. Or a somewhat frightened rabbit looking up at the sky that way. So if you're putting a necktie on the rabbit, it would go here. You're putting it on the duck, it would go here. Everybody got that? Now, it's of some interest philosophically because uh, once you see it as either a duck or a rabbit, you can't see it both as once. And it's hard to see it as what it really is, namely just a bunch of lines. Uh, notice a very important fact, which we'll get to when we talk about uh, pictorial representation. It doesn't look at all like a real duck or a real rabbit. If somebody sold you a rabbit, I'm going to sell you a rabbit, I'll bring it around the house, and it looked like that, you'd ask for your money back. Or if you actually encountered a duck in the zoo that looked like that, you'd think you'd had too much to drink. Uh, so uh, it, it doesn't actually look like either. And the mechanisms by which we're able to interpret it is either a duck or a rabbit. Uh, those are, I think, quite remarkable. And when we, um, uh, when, we, when we get to the subject of pictorial representation, I, over, uh, I will go over this. Uh, the single most powerful uh, discussion uh, or philosophical analysis of pictorial representation I saw again day before yesterday in the Prado Museum, and it's called Las Maninas by Diego Velazquez, and I'll try and show you 
uh, representation of it. You know, when, uh, do we have? We used to, in this room used to have well, a nice thing for slide projector. Oh, there it is. Good, thank God. Ancient technology survives, um, and I'll, I'll I'll try to show you uh, that and other such examples. But in any case, uh, the uh, the point for the present is that Davidson is trying to tell us that metaphor is like seeing as. That when, when I say Sally's a block of ice, don't think that is a statement, more, more like an instruction. See Sally as a block of ice. And as Davidson is anxious to insist, seeing as is not the same as seeing that. Now I see, on my view, a propositional content is conveyed. Not on Davidson's view. On Davidson's view, there is no separate set of truth conditions beyond the literal. And, and, and that's why he says most metaphors are just false as far as propositional content. It's just false that Sally's a block of ice, just as most similes are true. Sally's like a block of ice. Well, everything's like something in some respect or other. I, uh, so I, I, he thinks... Uh, that it's a mistake to think there are two, uh, uh, that they, there is a metaphorical propositional content that is conveyed. Now, I think there, there, there are no doubt cases, poetic cases, uh, where uh, this uh, would be the case. I mean, maybe we ought to think of um, uh, Romeo's saying about Juliet, Juliet is the sun. We should perhaps think of that along Davidsonian's line, see Juliet as if she were the Son. Uh, but what seems to me decisive against Davidson is that you can actually have debates about the truth of the metaphorical utterance. I say, Sally's a block of ice, and you say, you don't know Sally. Sally's a bonfire. Now, I won't go through the details here, uh, but it seems to me clear that the two guys we imagine uh, having this argument about that are actually arguing about propositional content, and they can spell it out in what respects they think the one metaphorical uh, interpretation is right and the other metaphorical interpretation, the other metaphorical understanding is wrong. If you look at the literature, there's another odd feature about this, and that is, in general, when people write about metaphor, uh, their, tend to, their tendency is to think, isn't it wonderful? And then they quote passages from the romantic poets. And I got so exasperated at this when I was writing an article about metaphor uh, that I decided, look, the opposite attitude, be utterly philistine is the right attitude to take. So give dumb examples like Sally's a block of ice, Bill is a pig. Uh, and so I, I don't think I got a single uh, quotation from the romantic poets, uh, you know, hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert. Uh, well, that's true, unless some metaphors going on there, and we could analyze those, but I didn't do that in that particular article. Uh, so uh, what I thought was that we ought to be able to analyze the, uh, uh, the way that metaphor actually functions, the way that it actually works, uh, without appealing uh, to the aesthetic ecstasies that come over us when we read Byron, Shelley, and, their, and Keats. Uh, however, uh, maybe I'm, uh, I'm missing something, and Davidson th uh, thinks, well, everybody's missing something if they think there's a separate such thing as metaphorical propositional content conveyed, and I think there is. Now, uh, what happens in many cases is that the metaphor comes into the language because there's no literal way to say what we wanted to say. Uh, so we say of uh, uh, the pattern of dots, that it is a, a mosaic, comparing it with a mosaic pavement. Or we say of the tool you use to push your computer cursor around, we say that it's a mouse uh, because we don't have a literal expression for that. And now what happens in those cases is that the metaphorical meaning becomes a dead metaphor. Uh, that, that metaphorical meaning, uh, the, the word now develops a new literal meaning. But that's interesting to us. That's not something to be sneered at because, of course, what that shows is there was a semantic need. And the metaphor filled that need to the point that it became dead I, it became a new literal meaning. 
All right, so let's go through the, the chart. The first one shows literal utterance. The metaphorical utterance is the case where you go through the literal meaning to get to the intended metaphorical utterance meaning. Now notice the go through in what I just said, that's a metaphor. I don't have another way to describe it. And we do have these systematic associations between such things as movements or spatial positions and alternative propositional contents that we can convey. Now what's going on here? Well, it seems to me that metaphor functions on the basis of perceived, I want to say similarities, but of course the similarities need not be literal similarities. Uh, so for example, you're all familiar with how to do graphs, uh, but the graph uh, is itself, I mean this is a standard economics graph uh, where the marginal cost equals the marginal revenue and you have a supply curve. The, more, the higher the price, the more uh, will be supplied and the higher the price, the less will be demanded. So you get the uh, supply and demand curves and then the rational entrepreneur sells at this point. Okay, but I want you to notice the processes by which this representation works. They are metaphorical. There's n nothing literally similar between the, the height here and uh, the amount uh, in, in dollars that's being asked for the product. It's just rather that you understand it naturally that way. Similarly, left to right is a metaphor for time. And if you think of, of graphs that show the passage of time, they always work uh, time going on the left to right x-axis. I, so the processes by which certain sorts of pictorial representations work are themselves metaphorical processes. And I think you ought to understand graphs as an application of spatial representations for other sorts of phenomena. Now a fascinating case that I don't fully understand is musical notation. It seems to us perfectly natural that the that the higher the note is on the score, uh, the higher its frequency will be in, in its actual playing. But it's not necessary to think of it that way. And I'm told that I, in, the, in the evolution of musical notation, there were times when the lower down uh, conveyed uh, a, 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 a higher number frequency. That seems very unnatural uh, to me because I'm part of our background culture. And <clears throat> I don't know if this is still true, but there was a time when we didn't know how to play Greek, ancient Greek music because though we had the notation, we had no idea how to interpret it. I don't know if that's still true. Some of you should look it up and track that down. It would be interesting uh, to know. Uh, so there's nothing inevitable. Uh, the musical score that we uh, use, the way we have of uh, doing musical notation, has now become, I think, uh, culturally universal. But it's not inevitable. It is a form of metaphor whereby you give spatial representations, where you can give a set of notational representations for sounds that pe people are supposed to actually play and hear. Uh, okay, so there's a huge literature on metaphor going back to Aristotle, and there's something deep about it that I want to emphasize. All predication works on the perception of similarities. If you say something's red, you are saying it is similar to other things in respect of a certain color. If you say it's tall or heavy, uh, you have a similarity a relation. Now, the interesting thing is the similarities need not be literal, as when I say there's a similarity relation between uh, uh, the, uh, the, the height I, uh, of the, uh, the y-axis uh, and uh, the uh, amount of money involved, uh, or a similarity uh, between uh, the passage of time and spatial relations. The spatialized metaphor for time are pervasive in our Western civilization. I don't know that they're per pervasive in all situations. So we think of time as something that 
passes and we have all these metaphors. Uh, time whizzed by or crawled by or slowly inched forward as we were waiting for the plane in the Air Force. There's the spatial metaphors for the passage of time are pervasive even though there's no literal similarity. Okay, but now literal predication and metaphorical predication both rest on the assumption of similarity. Uh, and this is what uh, drives people to say silly things like, well, all language is metaphorical. Well, that's not literally true, but it's not a bad metaphor. Metaphor is there being used metaphorically. If I say all language is a metaphorical, because what I mean is all language is like metaphor in resting on similarity. But of course it can't literally be the case that all language is metaphorical because uh, the metaphorical use of language presupposes the literal use of language on which the metaphorical intended speaker meaning is based. Did everybody get that? Uh, sentence. I, I doubt if I can repeat it in my current jet lag condition. I won't make it past Greenland if I try to uh, do that again. But anyway, I think you get the, uh, the basic idea that we are understanding uh, that there is something deep in the metaphor that all language is metaphorical, uh, and that is that our ability to understand a language rests on our ability to perceive similarities, and those types of similarities are the types of similarities that enable us to go beyond the literal meaning to the metaphorical intended speaker's meaning of an utterance. So it's false that all language is literally metaphorical, but it's metaphorically true that all language is metaphorical because all language, like metaphor, rests on the perception of similarities. Okay, now there's a huge literature on metaphor, and Aristotle says it's a mark of real genius to be able uh, to coin new metaphors. Uh, but indirect speech acts, well, nobody much cares about them, but I think they're interesting for this uh, phenomenon that we were uh, just uh, describing. And the indirect speech act differs from uh, the metaphorical utterance in that the indirect speech act is always a case where the literal speaker meaning is meant and understood and you get to the intended speaker meaning by understanding the literal sentence meaning. So the guy literally does ask you whether you can pass the salt when he asks you to pass the salt by asking you can you pass the salt. Uh, so the the I want I guess one reason that um, um, indirect speech acts seem less exciting uh, than metaphor is that they don't have this uh, creative uh, capacity. Uh, there's another problem uh, for the um, uh, the Davidsonian approach that says, well, there's no such thing as uh, metaphorical speaker meaning. Uh, and that is, it's hard to see why some metaphors work and others don't. Now notice, work in that sentence is a metaphor. Uh, why is it that some metaphors are readily understood and others not? If I, oh God, I just visited Sam's apartment. Sam is a pig. Well, you all understand that. But if I say, oh, I just visited Sam's apartment. Sam's a prime number. I have no idea how to interpret that. You know, he's a prime number greater than 17 and lower than 40 than 37, but still a prime number. Uh, and I'm still stuck. You know, what do I look for? I mean, Sam's a pig. Okay, I won't go to his apartment, but Sam's a prime number. Uh, what do I do? Get out my pocket calculator? I have no idea what to do with that one. So some metaphors work and others don't. I, and that's uh, why it seems to me a theory of metaphor has to explain how that's so. Now, as I said earlier, not all metaphors work in all languages. And if somebody were really going to be serious about this, uh, they ought to figure out why I, uh, the French student metaphors, the French student slang is different from the American student slang. And I, I mean, that's just a factual, uh, a theoretical issue that I don't understand. Okay, now we get to these other cases of, uh, and in the, in the article I wrote, I treat them as like metaphor, but I'm not sure that's right. Um, uh, synecdoche and metonymy. Um, by the way, I think if we actually went back and looked 
at the, at the great Renaissance rhetorical theorists, we'd probably find that their accounts are more sophisticated than what we're writing today. But if you think of metonymy, uh, the standard uh, a dictionary a definition of metonymy, did I spell it right? Meton I think it's right. For jet lag spelling, it's not bad. Uh, 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 the standard example are things like, well, the White House announced uh, that such and such. Well, what, the House announced? I mean, the door opened, a lot of noise came out. No, the White House, there is a metonymy, and the metonymy is supposed to be for uh, it's the container for the thing contained. Uh, so the container is the White House, and what's the thing contained? God knows. But anyway, that's how we're supposed to understand metonymy. And I treated, in the article I wrote, metonymy as like synecdoche. i uh, sorry, as metonymy is like metaphor. Now, synecdoche, I never did get a, a good synec... I always want to say synecdoche but I'm sure that's wrong, sign, neck, do, key. I'm, spelling question mark, okay, uh, if you want to write that in your notes. Synecdoche is things like, well, I have 17 head of cattle I, on my ranch. Well, if, I, if you went out there and what you find were 17 dead heads in the field, uh, you'd think I misled you because you understand that differently. Uh, and then, of course, the most common uh, types of uh, figurative uses are uh, hyperbole uh, and understatement. In hyperbole, somebody gave an example last time. Oh, God, there were millions of people at the party. Well, they don't mean millions. They don't even mean one million. Uh, that's an, an exaggeration, but that's perfectly standard, and I think the mechanism by which we understand that are the kinds that you're already familiar with. Namely, you know that the literal utterance can't be true, so you get an intended speaker meaning, which is not the same as the literal sentence meaning. Uh, and you think, well, what the guy's really trying to tell me is there were a lot of people at the party. How about irony and sarcasm? Well, there you understand the opposite of the literal sentence meaning. So you hear the sentence, John is very intelligent, or Sally's very pretty. Uh, as ironical as meaning uh, John is really stupid and Sally looks awful uh, and you have cues that the, uh, that, the, that the sentence is used ironically. Now some linguists say well what we do is rely on the special intonation contour of oh he's very intelligent. Um, I, I, but you, the interesting thing about irony is you don't have to have a special intonation. There is such thing as deadpan irony, where the guy says an ordinary, I've noticed the metaphor there, deadpan, uh, the guy says in perfectly ordinary tones, yeah, John's very intelligent, uh, where it's obvious from the context that he thinks John is a total idiot, uh, and so on with other examples. Now, again, as usual, the French have wonderful... Uh, ways of uh, saying uh, uh, things ironically. And one of my favorites, I don't know if this still survives, but when I uh, was more uh, uh, active in French culture than I am now, if you want to say that a girl looked awful, you said, she has pretty eyes. Elle a des beaux yeux. Uh, meaning, well, that's about the only good thing you can say about her. Uh, and I think that's a case of Grice's maxim of quantity. Is that the most you can say about her? Is she has pretty eyes? Uh, so that is taken to imply she doesn't look very good. Uh, this is, by the way, a, uh, <laughs> a, a, a continuing obsession in French civilization is how good people look. Uh, Americans are more interested in the sexual uh, aspects uh, directly. Well, I won't go into detail about this. Uh, there's a funny article in today's New York Times uh, about the, uh, the evolution of beauty contests in France. They, they have a Miss France that's a straight imitation of Miss America. They even call it Miss. They don't call her Mademoiselle. And it turns out they're two rival uh, uh, teams trying to produce Miss France. And one is representing the, the, the great tradition, and it's run by a 75-year-old former Miss France. Uh, but then there's the new, the nouvelle vague, so to speak, of Miss France. Anyway, you can read a very funny article. It's in today's New York Times. I just read it, so I'm reminded of it. Okay, so I'm now going to leave 
uh, this, what I think is a, uh, one of the most fascinating subjects, is the relation between uh, literal sentence meaning and intended speaker meaning. Now, some people have said, well, look, if you're right about all this, then really there's no such thing as literal sentence meaning. It's a mistake to think that we have this literal sentence meaning. What you've got is a set of tools, I'll take questions in a second, is a set of tools for conveying speaker meaning, but that's all that really exists. There's no such thing as literal sentence meaning. I think that's wrong too, and the reason for that is how is it possible to learn a language? When you learn a language, you have to learn the literal meaning of the words and how to combine those words into sentences. Uh, so I don't think that the, as it were, the pervasiveness of pragmatic intended speaker meaning uh, can overcome the fact or somehow uh, uh, discount the fact uh, that you have to be able to understand the syntactical units and their combination into sentences and the s literal semantic content of those sentences in able to learn and understand a language at all. Now there are enormous implications of what I just said that I haven't spelled out but I want to spell them out before the end of the semester and that, that the two implications are one um, uh, social and cultural and secondly uh, moral. Uh, the first implication is that in fact uh, all of what we consider as institutional reality of money and property and government and marriage and universities, cocktail parties, football games, stock markets, uh, national payments, all of those are linguistically constituted. Uh, you cannot have a President of the United States without representing somebody as President of the United States. You can't have a $20 bill without representing something as a $20 bill, and that has to be done linguistically. Uh, and I'm going to explain to you how that works, but I want you to see that now. Uh, secondly, there is an implicit axiology, an implicit ethic in, in the use of language, because you can't even say such things as uh, there's a man at the door without committing yourself in certain ways. You're committed to the truth of what you say, but more ominously, you're committed to identifying relevantly similar phenomena in exactly the relevantly similar way. So if you say there's a man at the door, then you're committed to recognize that in an exactly similar situation, there would also be a man at the door. So I told you earlier, language like metaphor is inherently general, is inherently rests on similarities, but it also has this other feature, namely it's inherently general. Once you recognize the meaning of a term, you recognize the meaning of the term red or man or dog or cat or water, you recognize that there are similar classes of things which will be uh, identified that way on the basis of resemblance, but also you recognize that the notion is itself perfectly general. It applies to a potentially infinite number of examples. Uh, okay, now the problem is that in most courses, most books on the philosophy of language, uh, people don't pay attention to these facts, and, and I think they are crucial. Language is used to create human civilization in ways that I've only hinted at but haven't yet explained to you. Language rests on the recognition of similarities, which pre-linguistic intentionality does not have. See, pre-linguistic intentionality doesn't commit you to recognize similar phenomena in similar ways. And, and the third language is inherently general. When you get the general terms, then they mark an indefinitely large class of entities as falling under the general term. Okay, now I saw various questions. I'm beginning with Kelly. You have to talk louder for me. Yes, the difference between metaphor and I. 
Okay, the, the difference between metaphor and irony is this. In irony, there is a rather simple method of uh, in operation. Namely, in the ironic utterance, you understand the intended speaker meaning as the opposite of the literal sentence meaning. Now, notice that we have a psychological reality to opposite, which is not the same as negation. So when I say, he's very intelligent, meaning that ironically, I mean more than it's not the case that he is intelligent. I mean he is the opposite of intelligent, namely stupid. So irony works on, a, on a, an important psychological reality, namely that we have a psychological reality to the notion of the opposite. And it's, it's not the same as the notion of a propositional negation. Metaphor, on the other hand, works on a set of principles by which the literal sentence meaning uh, is used to convey an intended speaker meaning. And I tried to give a list of those principles in the article that's assigned. However, the difficult cases are the cases in the upper right-hand side of your uh, chart here, where it's open-ended, uh, where uh, I say, I, uh, uh, or Romeo says, Juliet is the sun, and there's a whole lot of things that he might mean by that. I, 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 uh, Juliet is a source of energy to me. My day begins with Juliet. Juliet is a source of, of life and inspiration to me, and a lot of these are themselves metaphorical, so there's nothing lazier than giving a metaphorical interpretation of a metaphorical utterance. Uh, but there, I'm, I think that's probably um, a, a not a perspicuous way of representing this. But what I'm trying to get at, in the cases that are most uh, sympathetic or the most favorable to the Davidsonian account that there's no such thing as metaphorical meaning, the problem is not that there's no such thing, but there are too many. Uh, there are too many possible metaphorical uh, meanings, and we're not quite sure which one or how many the speaker intended. Uh, and again, pick your favorite poetic metaphors as examples of that. Yes? What about the difference between um, irony and sarcasm? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think sar a sarcasm is nastier uh, than uh, irony. Irony, you can kind of go away with it, but if the guy's really sarcastic, I, uh, then you can't evade it. If he says ironically, uh, well, the food in this restaurant that you have recommended uh, is perfectly okay. He says that ironically, well, you can kind of, you know, all right, so I'm not insulted by that. And he said, oh, you recommended this restaurant? Ah, oh, the food, that's really wonderful. Ugh. Well, okay. That <laughs> That's sarcasm, and there I think it's less subtle. However, I, that'd be a good topic for you to work out. Write me a short note on Dernstein irony and sarcasm, because I haven't worked it out. Uh, okay, I mean, some cultures are much more ironical uh, than other cultures. Uh, and of course, you always want to beware of the fact that different metaphors, as they acquire different literal meanings, uh, will be, as they become dead metaphors, I give you a picture of the dead metaphor uh, here, uh, where you just no longer go through the literal meaning. And I think for me, for example, I, I don't hear the leg of the table or the computer mouse uh, as, uh, uh, as live metaphors. Those are dead metaphors for me. Uh, when I think of the leg of the table, I don't think, well, where's the knee? And where's the toe? I mean, and the true the test is very simple, a psychological test. It's a dead metaphor for you if you don't think of the literal meaning when you hear the metaphor. I no longer think of actual rodents when I go to a store to buy a new computer mouse. It's a dead metaphor uh, for me. But as I said, different uh, cultures will encode these differently, and you want to be careful. A famous example is that uh, in English, uh, to knock up. Uh, means to come and knock on your door. So the Englishman says to the visiting American girl, I'll come and knock you up this afternoon. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, this produces a lot of cultural misunderstanding. I'm talking about actual historical examples here, because as some of you probably know, it means something different in American English uh, from just knocking on your door. Uh, okay. 
So how much time? Well, let's take questions. I'm going to get off of the uh, subject of metaphor. Metaphor, to speak metaphorically, is a bitch. Um, uh, but uh, uh, indirect speech acts, it's kind of well-defined. And, you know, uh, people take my stuff and they program their computers to understand indirect speech acts, and it works pretty well. It never works perfectly. But uh, they take the stuff on metaphor to try to get the computer to understand metaphor. Not so easy. It's pretty difficult. I saw some more hands up. Yes. Well, I don't think so. Now, this is a good question, and it would lend a credence to the, uh, to the Davidsonian approach if all metaphors were really uh, open-ended. Uh, but if I say, you see, a, a, a lot of these metaphors have become dead. Now, take cold uh, for emotion. If, you, if I say she's a very cold person, I, that is now, I think, become a dead metaphor. And in, indeed, I, last time I looked in the dictionary under cold, one of the meanings, one of the literal meanings of cold is unemotional. But I don't think that's true for things like block of ice or uh, Bill was a real uh, wet blanket at the party. Maybe that's a dead metaphor by now. I don't know, wet blanket. Do you still think of wet blankets? I, I kind of think of wet blankets. Uh, uh, so that's a partly dead metaphor. But I don't think block of ice is open-ended like Julia is the sun or uh, a bird thou never wert uh, and, and all of, and these uh, poetic metaphors uh, uh, that you uh, get in romantic poetry they're open ended in a different way okay uh, any other questions I want to go to another subject we got so many subjects I don't know where to start but one I left myself 15 minutes that we can at least get started uh, there are some famous issues in the philosophy of language uh, that you ought to know about uh, even though I am pretty much unsympathetic with the way that they're described or with the whole issue. Now, there is a famous article by Quine in which he attacks the analytic-synthetic distinction on the grounds that nobody has given an adequate definition of analyticity. Uh, they uh, say an analytic proposition is one uh, which is true in virtue of meanings. Uh, or one where you can get an identity statement by substituting synonyms. So they think bachelors are unmarried is analytic because you can substitute the synonym uh, unmarried man for bachelor and you have all unmarried men are unmarried men instead of all bachelors are unmarried men. Uh, so you get the identity statement and that's supposed to explain analyticity. Okay, now says Quine, there's something wrong with that, and that is it uses the notion of meaning and synonymy, which are just as mysterious as the notion of analytic. And he says the notion of analytic is supposed to be the notion of a sentence which will hold true no matter what the evidence is. No matter what the evidence is, you will hold true all bachelors are unmarried or all bachelors are unmarried men. But, says Quine, any sentence might be held true if you're willing to make other adjustments in the system of your beliefs, in the system of the sentences that you think are true. I, I don't think this is a very powerful argument, but it has become uh, influential in the literature. And in, this is in an article called Two Dogmas of Empiricism. Uh, and <clears throat> Hilary Putnam says it's the most important article of the 20th century, or he has some uh, hyperbolic account of it. I, I don't think that, but certainly it was influential. Now, what's wrong with it? Uh, well, first of all, he treats analytic as if it were an epistemic category, uh, as if what it means to say that a, st a statement is analytic is to say uh, you will believe it's true no matter what the evidence uh, is for or against it because it's, so to speak, immune from revision. But it's not an epistemic category. It's a semantic category. Uh, it has to do with what's true or false in virtue of meaning. Now, Quine rejects the notion of meaning, but so much the worse for him. I don't think we can get on without the notion of meaning. The problem with the notion of analyticity is not that it can't be given a, a non-circular definition. Most interesting words can't be given a non-circular definition. No philosopher has ever given a, a definition of truth uh, that wasn't circular or a definition of causation for reasons that uh, we saw in the case of Tarski. Tarski tried to do it uh, in the case of truth, but he did it only by changing the subject. 
I, so I don't think his objections uh, can be taken seriously. The real difficulty is that the analyticity always rests on a set of background assumptions. It always rests on uh, 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 a, ba a background, on, a, on the pervasiveness of the background capacities that enable you to interpret any sentence at all. Uh, and for that reason, um, I, it's just, it, it isn't that we abandon the notion of being true by definition. No, it's still useful, but you have to understand it's relative to a background. Uh, if I say, uh, I want you to introduce Sally to a bachelor, and bachelor's unmarried man, and you introduce Sally to the Pope. Have you introduced him, uh, have you introduced her to a bachelor? Well, I mean, I, I, the Pope, I guess, satisfies the definition. He's unmarried, and he's definitely male, but is he a bachelor? Well, not the way I use it. Not, my background is different. He gets kind of left out uh, in the, in the, uh, <laughs> Uh, in, the, in the bachelor line of business. So the problem with uh, analyticity is I, uh, uh, not that the definitions are circular uh, they, because they rely on notions like synonymy uh, and meaning, but that they, <coughs> I, they give you the idea that you have a, a set of truths that are totally background free or background independent and that seems to me wrong. However, there's a deeper mistake in this whole discussion, and that is somehow or other, there's something preferable about uh, the statement, all unmarried men are unmarried, that's okay, but all bachelors are unmarried, that's supposed to be puzzling. Uh, the first is a logical truth because you have the same expression on both sides of the pre uh, is. All unmarried men are unmarried. Uh, and Quine thinks that's okay. He has a problem with all bachelors are unmarried, but I think they're exactly the same. I suppose I said, well, the reason that all unmarried men are unmarried is okay is really it's a substitution of instance of all bachelors are unmarried, which is a paradigm of analyticity. What's supposed to be preferable about logical truth over ordinary analyticity? And I think nothing other than a prejudice for the syntactical similarity could lead people to this mistake to suppose that there's something somehow preferable to the logical identity statement, all, bat all unmarried men are unmarried men, to the ordinary English analytic statement, all bachelors are unmarried men. I want to say they're exactly the same as far as my ability to understand them as stating something that's true by definition. So it's the preference for the, uh, the syntactical identity, but that's got to be wrong uh, because the syntactical identity is not sufficient to guarantee identity of meaning. And that should have been obvious to everybody. But take again the English and the American. In American English, sick means ill. But in English English, uh, sick means you want to throw up. Uh, but if he is sick, then he is sick, is not analytic if I'm using the first uh, uh, sick in the American sense. If he's got an illness, uh, then he wants to throw up. Uh, no, that's not analy analytic. So just having the same sound, the same morpheme, the same syntactical unit isn't sufficient to guarantee logical truth. It cause why? It depends on the meaning and it depends on how the sentence is uttered. Both of those occurrences of sick are literal. If he's sick, then he's sick. But one is literal American and the other is literal English. Uh, okay, however, this leads to a much more radical and more interesting discussion, again due to Quine. Incidentally, uh, when he was alive, Quine was probably the most influential um, uh, philosopher in the world, and he was a marvelous intelligence and always worth arguing with. I think he was uh, almost totally mistaken on all the important issues, but I think that about most of the great philosophers. I mean, uh, that's true of Kant or Hume or Leibniz or anybody, so don't think I'm putting down Quine when I say he was wrong. Uh, he's, in a, he's in bed with Leibniz, note the metaphor there, uh, in bed with Leibniz, Kant, and all the other great philosophers. But he held, the most uh, radical view that he held is Really, there's no such things as meanings anyhow. And here's the proof. <clears throat> Suppose I go as an anthropologist 
to a native tribe. I find this tribe in the Amazon basin. And I notice that whenever a rabbit runs past, they always say the same thing. They shout, Gaba Guy. Okay, now says Quine, if I am a good linguist, I will interpret that as meaning rabbit. Or as he says, maybe I should say low a rabbit. All right, but says Quine, now wait a second. If you think of the evidence that I'm presented with, how do I know the correct interpretation isn't stage in the life history of a rabbit? For that is all that the native actually saw. See, here's this rabbit runs past. The native shouts, Gabba guy. Now I'm trying to figure out what does he mean? Now says Quine, well, the natural thing for me to say would be he means rabbit, because that's what I would say. Uh, maybe I could expand it a bit and say, lo, a rabbit. Uh, but that's, uh, it turns out, not necessarily the only translation that fits the data. An equally good translation would be stage in the life history of a rabbit, because that's all that the natives saw, right? Or how about undetached rabbit parts? For well, that's all that the native saw. The native saw a bunch of undetached rabbit parts ambling past. Or how about, well, what the, the native really meant was instantiation of the Platonic universal of rabbithood. Uh, why not? That fits all the evidence. Or how about, suppose the native thinks of it as an activity. Uh, there is something going on here, like rain, only we should translate it as rabbit death. Uh, that is the activity of rabbiting is occurring right in front of our eyes. Quine, incidentally, was a master of languages, uh, and he could see he seemed to learn any language. With uh, rabbit death is what, how we're supposed to hear uh, hear that, and he seems to have no problem with language. I was once with him in a conference in a in a, a German speaking community, and he was perfectly happy to converse with everybody in German. He had a terrible American accent, but anyway, most of us do. Uh, I, I, so the, the point he's making is there seem to be an indefinite number of translations which are consistent with all of the evidence. So says Quine, now this is the, uh, where he gets to his conclusion, there is no fact of the matter about meaning. And if there's no fact of the matter, then there isn't any fact about meaning. Why? Because any amount of alternative and inconsistent translations will be consistent with all possible evidence about what the native actually meant. The native said rabbit, a native said gabba guy, and our interpretation is, our natural interpretation would be to say, well, gabba guy means rabbit. When we're making a dictionary, that's what we'll do. But Quine says, the evidence is just as good that the native meant stage in the life history of a rabbit, undetached rabbit parts, activity of rabbiting, instantiation of the uh, Platonic universal of rabbithood, etc. There seems to be no limit of the number of alternative and inconsistent translations that can be made consistent with all possible data. And this is a, a very um, uh, influential view of Quine's. I like all these things, it's got a name. It's called the indeterminacy, indeterminacy of translation. And that means since translation is supposed to preserve meaning, it's the indeterminacy of meaning. And it's in its most radical form, it comes out as follows. The notion of meaning is inherently an ill-defined notion. It is a notion of no scientific validity because anything which is scientifically valid must be something that is testable. We must have some test for the presence of meaning. But where meaning is concerned, there is no fact of the matter 
which we establish by evidence, because any evidence at all will be consistent with, or rather any translation at all will be consistent, any a translation within a range of translations will be consistent with any and all possible evidence. No matter how much evidence you got, you will always be able uh, to make your translation consistent with that evidence. So if you're in, uh, inclined to say, well, it must mean a stage uh, uh, in the life history of a rabbit, uh, then if suppose you could present a guy uh, with only the stage in the life history by, say, one millisecond of a rabbit. Is that a, a guy? And if the guy says no, well, as you still don't know that that was the right translation because there are alternative interpretations of what he said as no. Maybe no meant yes. Maybe what you thought as no was really yes, or maybe it was yes used ironically. How do you, since you have only a finite amount of evidence, the evidence will always, it can always be made consistent with any number of alternative and, and this is the crucial point, inconsistent translations. Uh, now years ago I was writing a book on intentionality and I thought there are two great threats uh, to intentionality. One is Quine's indeterminacy argument. Uh, so I wrote a long article attacking that and, I, and it's in Al's book. It's in the Martinez book and it's a sign. You should read that article called The Indeterminacy of Translation. And another threat was Kripke's skepticism about meaning, so I wrote an article attacking that. I had to get both of these off my back uh, before I could write my book on intentionality. Anyway, the uh, curse of that is you have to read my refutation of Quine and I want you to read that before next Tuesday. Okay, we got time for one question. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if it might be possible for you to even consider letting us turn it on Thursday. And you know, I, I'm still, my stomach is still somewhere over Iceland, and I don't want to think about the calendar yet. What day is this? I mean, yeah. Well, it's just, it's the, it's the, do the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, yeah. and so a lot of people are going to be driving. I was just wondering if we could. I have to. I have to talk with my colleagues because they have to grade these things. Uh, but if so, look on B-Space. We'll announce it if we're going to make a change. Yeah. 